Welcome everybody to the third week of discrete mathematics. In this week we will be continuing our study for proof techniques and in particular we will look at the proof technique of contradiction and contrapositiveness. So to recall we were dealing with the techniques of proving a statement like A implies B. There are many proof techniques that can be applied for proving A implies B, namely constructive proof, proof by contradiction, contrapositive, induction, counterexample, existential, etc. Now this is something I have told again and again in all the video lectures regarding proof, uh, proof techniques that which proof to apply depends on the problem. In this course, we will be giving you all the different proof techniques, or at least most of them. But whether to uh, which proof technique to apply or which problem completely depends on you. Sometimes the problem can be split into smaller problems, and that can make it easier. Sometimes viewing the problem in a different way can make it easier. But whether to split a problem or how to split a problem or how to look at it in a different way is an art that has to be developed by you. In other words, there are some thumb rules that we will give. For example, if the problem is of this kind, then this kind of technique can be helpful. But at the end of the day, which proof technique to apply? depends fully on your skill that you have to develop by doing a lot of practice. Now till now we have seen some of the tricks. The first thing that we saw was how to split a problem into smaller problems when the B that is the deduction is of the form C and D. So in other words, if B is of the form C and D, then A implies B is same as proving A implies C and A implies D. We saw an example how to use this particular uh, way of splitting the problem can help you to split a problem into two parts. We saw one such example. The next technique that we learned was that sometimes reducing assumptions can be helpful. In other words, there can be assumptions that are not necessary and we can throw them away. For example, if I have been asked to prove A and C implies B and all that I need is A and I can prove A implies B then that means that this C is a redundant assumption and we can safely throw it away. Thus, given the set of assumptions, one has to find out what are the actual subset of assumptions that might be useful. The rest of them can be thrown away. So, in other words, A implies B is good enough. I mean, A implies B implies. A and C implies B. Again, which assumptions are needed and which assumptions can be thrown away depends on the problem and you have to identify them using your intelligence. Now, the third technique. A third trick that we learned was that sometimes proving something harder can actually be easier. So in other words, if we have to prove A implies B and if we can prove that C implies B, then A implies B is fol follows. So in other words, while it might be harder to prove A implies C, but if we can prove A implies C, 
then we get A implies B. Sometimes this harder prop statement is easier to prove. For example, here notice that A implies C is strictly harder than A implies B. But proving the harder statement can actually be more helpful, more easier than solving the easier statement A implies B. Now moving on, after the set of useful tricks, we looked at the problem and the first major approach of find solving a problem, namely constructive proof. The idea of constructive proof is that if we have to solve A implies B, we work with A and start working ahead and end up proving B. Now we split up the constructive proof into two parts. First part was the direct proof, meaning you directly prove A, I mean directly prove B from A. And the second one was this case study, where we split the problems into smaller problems depending on A. To recall, for the direct proof, either you can start from A and make a step by step deduction and end up proving B. Or sometimes this direct proof can be quite magical. So we might want to come up with a different technique. The technique that we suggested was that going backwards, namely start with B, you start with the thing that you have to prove, work with it, and slowly simplify it to get a simpler statement which might be easier to prove from A. So in other words, if you can prove that, if you can simplify B to C, that means C and B are basically equivalent statement, just that C has been more simplified, in that case, proving A implies B is same as proving A implies C. So working with B would help you to uh, working with B and simplifying A to C will help you to understand how to finally prove A implies C. Since C is a simplified form, so proving A implies C will be easier. Now in the context of case study, the idea was that sometimes we can split up the problem using two cases depending on A. So in other words, if the statement is of the following, that A equals to C or D, that means C or D implies B, then A implies B can be split up as C implies B and D implies B. So in some sense we can split up into cases that A is either C or D and in that case C implies B and D implies B is solved. We saw a couple of examples where we use this case study to solve the problems. So this was what we did till now. Namely, we looked at some of the techniques of splitting the problem into smaller parts and how to go about attacking them. Now in this video lecture, we will be looking at a completely new technique which we call proof by contradiction where the idea is to view the problem in a different way. So here is the idea. The idea is that, note that proving A implies B or this statement A implies B is equivalent to the statement not B and A is false. So in other words, to prove A implies B, one can prove not B and A is false. This is 
what is called the proof by contradiction. So if you have asked that, okay, assume A and then prove B, then what you are asked to prove or what you can prove is this statement that namely not B and A is false. From this particular expression that we have, a similar statement can be drawn which is also of this form. That A implies B is equivalent to not B implies not A. This is called the proof by contrapositive and we will be using this technique after a couple of videos. So in this video, we will be looking at the proof by contradiction in this part where we will be using not B and A is false to prove some statements. It is a very powerful proof technique and we apply it quite a lot in our various proofs. Mathematical proofs. So, what is it that we do in the case of proof by contradiction? A good example is to consider this following example. It's not a mathematical example as such, but something that's useful. Say we want to prove that the earth is not flat. But how do you prove that earth is not flat? One way of going about it is that, okay, let's try to prove it directly. Let me say, we say that, okay, when we see a ship coming from the horizon, we see first the top of the ship, and slowly the complete ship arises, right? And this follows from this usual proof that we have seen that if I am standing here and if there is a ship here, first what we see is the top of the ship and then much later on we see the bottom of this ship bottom of the ship appears slowly and the only way this can happen is that if it is not flat. This is the first technique that one can apply. This is what we call as the direct proof technique. This is the direct proof or proof or the constructive proof. The second way of saying is that, okay, let's assume that the art is flat. In that case, does something weird happen? Do we get a false statement? So, if the earth is flat, when the ship is coming from the horizon, the whole ship will appear at the same time. But that doesn't happen. We see the mass first and then the whole ship, and hence we get a contradiction. Although these two statements look so much similar, but the way in which these two are presented are very different. So this also tells us something important, namely these proof techniques are not necessarily written on stone. A single problem can have multiple different proof techniques. Now all we are saying is that here there are different kinds of proof techniques and you can choose any one of them. And for particular problems, obtaining a proof using one proof technique might just be easier than obtaining a proof using the other proof technique. And that's all that we are saying in this different type of proof techniques. Right? So, so in other words, proving that the arc is not flat can be done either using the con uh, constructive proof or using a proof by contradiction. So let's see an example. To 
see the example, we have to consider primes. And we have to prove that the primes are infinite. In other words, there are infinitely many primes. So, in other words, what we have to prove, we want to prove is that for all n greater than or equal to Okay, so let's see an example. So consider this problem of primes. Now what are primes? We know primes are numbers that cannot be divided by any other integer less than itself. So what are the primes that we know of? The primes that we know of are 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23, and so on and so forth, right? Now, is it that there is only a finite set of primes? For example, there are only 1000 primes or 10,000 primes or something like that? Or is it that there is always some prime? In other words, we want to prove that there are infinite number of primes. Or in other words, we want to say that the primes are not bounded by any large number. So, for all n, integer n, positive integer n, there always exists a number which is bigger than n and which is prime. So, there is a number prime that is always bigger than some number. So, you can pick your favorite n, so you tell me, okay, is there a prime bigger than 10 lakhs and I should be able to produce you one. So, this proves that Define the number of primes are not bounded by a large enough integer. They are infinite. Now, how do you prove this statement? How do you prove that the number of primes is indeed infinite? So, to prove that, we will prove it using contradiction. So, first of all, let us go back one step. What is the, if we want to formulate this statement that proof primes are infinite, if I have to formulate in the terms of A implies B, what is B and what is A? So, B is clear. So, B is primes are infinite, right? Primes are infinite. Now, what is A? There is no, as such, no A here. So, many times we will get such kind of questions. The A in this case is actually everything that we know to be correct. Everything. So, in fact, it basically says that with all the knowledge that you have, can you prove prime and infinite? So, if I have to prove the, this statement using the contradiction, how will we go about it? So, one way of going about it is, of course, remember, recall that we have to prove that this whole thing is congruent to not B and A. This is false. Right? Or in other words, this statement says that if B is, if B is not, I mean, if the number of primes is not infinite, or in other words, if the number of primes are finite, then something that we know must be be contradicted. So there is something, so A here, something that we know must have a contradiction. Right? And this is how we will go about proving our statement.
Okay, so let's continue with the proof. So let's assume that there are finitely many primes. So that means there is a largest prime. Let's call that one PT. And in that case, we say that the total the set of primes are the P1 to PT. P1, P2. Now consider this number, the product of all these primes plus 1. Now what is this number? First of all note that this number is strictly bigger than P2. Why? If you remember, the, we know that P1 is 2. We know P2 is 3 and so on. So this number P1 times P2 and 2 times dot 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 till Pt is bigger than 2ith Pt or 6 Pt and so on. Right? So that number, this number, product of all the Pt things plus 1, if this 1 turns out to be a prime, then what happens? Then it contradicts the fact, first of all, that Pt is the largest prime. We have assumed Pt is the largest prime, so it contradicts the fact that Pt is the largest prime. Because this one is clearly greater than Pt. Now can or is the product of P1 to Pt plus 1 a prime? Now if the product plus 1 is not a prime, then by the definition of a prime, something must be dividing it. And when something divides it, we have looked at this proof earlier, that if some number integer divides another integer, then there, are, there must be a prime that divides the other integer. So in other words, sum 1 of p1 to pt must divide the sum because p1 to pt are the only set of primes that we have but all the primes p1 to pt divides of course the product of them so when we divide the product plus 1 this number by any number, say, does P1 divide this number? When you divide this number by P1, what is remain? The remainder is 1. Similarly, the, when I divide it by P2, the remainder is 1. Similarly, when the, I divide it by the prime Pt, the remainder is 1. Or in other words, none of these primes, P1 to Pt, divides this new number. So this number is not divisible by any of the old primes P1 to P. What does it mean? It means that there is only one that this number has to be a prime. There is no number, no prime can divide this number. Hence this one is a prime. And this is a contradiction as we have discussed earlier because now we have a number that is a prime that is bigger than the largest prime, which cannot be. So, this proves that our initial assumption of Pt being the largest prime is false. In other words, there cannot be a largest prime. Or in other words, Pt cannot be or number of primes cannot be finite. So, basically, we prove that if P1 to Pt are the set of 
primes, finite set of primes, then I created a new number which was larger than the largest prime and we proved that it has to be a prime, which is a contradiction. Right. So this is a typical proof by contradiction where we start from assuming that the statement that we have to prove is not true and we work our, our way through and at the end prove that it contradicts something. Either it contradicts what we are assuming or it contradicts something that we know and so on and so forth. There are many related problems to this particular problem and I leave it to you for ex as an exercise. For example, prove that there are infinitely many primes of the form 1 mod 4. So namely, what are the primes 1 mod 4? Say 5, 13, 17, 29 and so on. Prove that there are infinitely many primes of the form 1 mod 4. Similarly, prove that there are infinitely many primes of the form 3 mod 4. Again, similarly, prove that there are infinitely many primes of the form 1 mod 6 and there are infinitely many primes of the form 5 mod 6. So, we will be doing some more problems using contradiction in the next video. So, in the next video, we will be proving some statement like that square root 2 is not a rational number. Now what is the rational number? A real number is rational if it can be written as ratio of two positive two integers. So if a number can be written as p by q where p and q are integers then we say it's a rational number. And the 1, 2, 3, so all of them can be written as 1 by 1, 2 by 1, 3 by 1. 2 by 3, 49 by 99, and so on. We claim that square root 2 is not a rational number. In the next video, we will be proving this particular problem using the same contradiction technique. I encourage you guys to go and try to solve this problem by yourself before you see the next video. Thank you.